Okay, good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. So if you want to sit, please find yourself a nice, comfortable spot to sit. And if you want to stand, that's also okay. I'm a big believer in being comfortable, so do whatever makes you feel comfortable and happy. My name's Linda Naranko. I'm the organizer of this conference called Create Eagle Access for All. And I wanted to say thank you so much for being here, for taking the time to learn about accessibility and how to create equal access for all. This conference has been in the making for about eight months. November 16th of last year is when we actually received the good news that we received funding from San Diego State Student Success Fees. So since then, we have been actually dealing with vendors and learning all these new skills to put on this conference. And so it was a conference that I believe has been inspired by hearing other people share their stories by my own experiences in the mental health system and by working with people who have so generously told me about their experiences. And I work at Disability Rights California. I'm a peer and my job is to uh, go around to locked mental health facilities and teach other peers about their rights. I'm also a social work student at San Diego State University. And I'm very proud to say that after 13 years from graduating from high school, I'm finally graduating with my bachelor's in social work on May 17th, thank you, of this year. Um, it took me many years to figure out what works best for me and my path to recovery. And uh, because of all my experiences, I started a future nonprofit or social enterprise called Advocacy Through FAM, which is food, art, and music. It's uh, based on uh, all the things that I found have really um, helped me find my way. Um, advocating is a big part of my life, and I want um, to thank you all again for being here because the people that I invited to come speak are true advocates for people who are different, who, for people who are um, just like us, human and experiencing life in a different way. And I just um, want everyone to hear their stories as well. Uh, one of my group members gave me uh, one of the nicest uh, compliments this week. And he said, thank you for being here. Uh, for sharing what's in your heart because now it's in our hearts and I want to say the same to you so thank you for being here uh, for being here to listen to the guest speakers share what's in their hearts and I hope that you will take those messages with you wherever you go and share them with other people so those messages of kindness and compassion empowering others will also be in their hearts and if you're a student or a healthcare provider or a business owner or if you're human, I remember that everyone's a person and they deserve to be treated with uh, equality, fairness, kindness, love, basically any positive word that you can think of, that's how everyone deserves to be treated. And so I wanted um, just to have you all remember that the next time you're talking to somebody, just remember, treat them with kindness, treat them as a person, and you never know what they're going through. So just say hi introduce yourself, um, ask them how they're doing, and take the time to listen. And I think if you just remember that, and we all remember that when we're working with people, then we're really going to get to know them as a person. And then secondly, maybe what they need help with or support with, or maybe they just need someone to talk to. Um, I want to keep what I have to say short because I'm really excited to present to you our keynote speaker, Mary Jensen. And she is someone that I met working at Disability Rights California. And I quickly learned that Mary is very well experienced in life. And that's saying it very oddly. Um, but I think if we were in school now, if we were all in school, she would be getting a PhD in life. And so I want um, to welcome Mary here. Um, we'll help her um, get started. Basically, if you have any questions about um, where the bathrooms are, if you're standing or sitting where you are, it's directly to your, I don't know, 8 p.m., 8 o'clock, if you're using the clock. Um, um, so that's where the bathrooms are. If, you're, if you want water, I guess it would be at your, I'm very bad with time and things, but maybe 6 o'clock. It's right, right behind us. It's free, and there's also free food in the self-care room. So I guess that would be like 
your one o'clock. That's where the dock side room is. It's your self-care room, and it's also where all the programs are in the resource fair. There's also water in there. Um, and if you need anything, please reach out to us volunteers in these gray shirts that say create equal access for all. We'll be happy to assist you with whatever that whatever it is that you need or have questions about. And I think at this point I'm just rambling. So um, thank you so much for being here again. And I hope you have a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for the introduction. So C.S. Lewis once said that you can't go back and change your beginning, but you can start where you are and change where you're going. And for the longest time, I thought that was the most useless thing I had ever heard. I didn't think it was possible to change my world and my life enough to have an impact on where I would end up. I had a decade of struggling and 190 odd percentage points telling me that it was inevitable that I would become a statistic. One of the 45,000 Americans who die by suicide every year. There's a common narrative when we discuss mental health amongst both patients and providers that recovery is possible but with the implication that the only meaning like behind that phrase is that recovery is shown by a total absence or amelioration of your mental health symptoms. And that's certainly possible for some of us. And for those that it is, I rejoice with them. I want to make space, though, for those of us who will have a really different experience of recovery. I didn't hear people talking about this idea of recovery until fairly recently. And when it, I did, it absolutely changed my life, and it saved my life. This paradigm shift, this acknowledgement that recovery isn't only something achieved as, a, as an end goal when you no longer experience any of your symptoms, it's something that patients need to know, yes, those of us going through it on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's also something that I think allies and especially mental health care providers are really responsible for addressing and spreading, because by addressing misconceptions about recovery, by reducing stigma around various diagnoses, and providing culturally competent mental health care, you can not only help save and improve lives, but you can also help contribute to the growth of whatever profession that you're in. My notes are out of order. So this past summer, I found myself near San Francisco, home to the Golden Gate Bridge. For those of you who don't know, conservative estimates say that since the bridge has opened, we have lost over 2,000 people to suicide there. It's an average of one every 10 days or so. Only 2% of those who have jumped, a little under 40 people, have survived the 225 foot fall from the span of the bridge to the bay below. There's a really strong mythos surrounding jumping from the bridge. Some say it's a painless death. Others say that if you jump from mid-span between the pillars, you won't die. You will be transported directly to the afterlife. A suicide prevention barrier is now in the works and it's due to be completed in a couple of years after decades of people fighting for it with the argument that it's not worth impeding the iconic view to save a couple of lives. Two thirds of the people who die at the Golden Gate Bridge are not from Northern California. It is an international icon and it is the second most popular, so to speak, place for people to die by suicide. Like many who struggle with suicidal thoughts, the bridge has long been a symbol, an icon to me, of hope, of an end to my pain, of death. 
When I found myself last summer up in San Francisco, about an hour from the bridge, I decided to make a pilgrimage of sorts. I thought I could walk across the bridge and I could look down at the water and it could be proof to myself that I had control over my own life and my survival and my destiny. And it seemed like a really great idea. I walked to the half point of the bridge, I looked out, you know, the, the city is iconic, the bay is beautiful, the fog had cleared, and I started to walk back. And I made it about halfway back to light pole 101, and there's this little outlet that you can stand and take pictures and, and you know, be a tourist and without impeding the flow of pedestrian traffic. And I sat there, and I stared down at the water, and all I could think about was the likelihood that I will never recover, right? I will never stop experiencing most of my mental health symptoms. And I didn't feel like I had any chance of surviving that. Facing down the next 60 odd years of this was insurmountable to me in that moment. I sat there for hours. I am too short to see over the four foot guardrail. And so I sat there like a kid at the zoo with my face pressed against the bar so I could stare down at the water. I thought about the 2,000 people that we've lost, the 36 so far who have survived a jump from the bridge. One of them, Kevin Hines, was the 26th survivor from a suicide jump there. And he has since begun, gone on to become a mental health advocate, author, and international speaker on suicide awareness. Forgive me. Um, and I thought about him and I assumed that he must be recovered, right? If he is so successful and he is thriving, he must not experience any of his symptoms. And it turns out, luckily, that his work and his father's work on the suicide prevention barrier and on training the Golden Gate Bridge patrol officers helped save my life. If you'll forgive me, I'm gonna take a moment and figure out where my notes are. So while I sat there, after passing me several times, an officer approached me and attempted small talk. His conversation with me is what I want you all as community care providers, as future mental health providers, as people who experience various mental health diagnoses to think about. He looked me in the eyes and he said, Mary, I'm gonna be blunt. Are you thinking about jumping? Now let's pause here. What do societal expectations say and dictate about asking someone if they are considering suicide? Not a rhetorical question, I am hoping for answers. What, what do we expect in that moment? They'll say no. Do we feel like we can ask people that, honestly? Right. We think, we have this misconception that we cannot discuss suicide with someone, even in a crisis moment, without pushing them to suicide. That it's something to be whispered about in analogies and metaphors behind closed doors, even that people in crisis are attention seeking. And that by offering them aid, we're actually only hindering their recovery because we're feeding into that, that cycle of, of seeking attention. There is something disarming about the bluntness of that question. A, frankly, when you are 225 feet above the water, but B, because we are in that culture where discussing suicide is so taboo. I will be frank and say I expected very little from this man in a uniform on a bridge. That he would be open enough to not only ask that question, but to hold space for my answer, which brings me to my next question. What do we do when we find out that someone is considering suicide? What do we do, both ideally and realistically? What, what do we do? Listen to their story. Listen to their story. Stay with them. 
try to convince them not to. Listen to, listen to. Listen to them. Right, and a lot of these are ideal answers, right? In practice, though, what do we often see, or what are our own gut reactions when someone discusses the possibility of suicide with us? Often they're platitudes. No, your family would miss you. Oh, it's not that bad. How selfish. Or my personal least favorite, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Let's talk about the fact that if you are facing the reality of your mental health diagnoses for the rest of your life, how invalidating and silencing that is to hear. Or we often get frightening reactions, right? Threats of calling hospitals for involuntary commitments, threats of calling the police, which statistically has not gone well for people experiencing mental health crises. Instead of giving in to these gut reactions, which would have shut down that conversation entirely, the Golden Gate Bridge patrol officer continued the conversation by asking questions and listening, just like you guys were saying. When someone is in a crisis, giving them the time to talk while actively listening to them allows for them to open up at their own pace as they feel safe to do so. We stayed on that bridge talking about whatever topic I decided to jump to for hours, which brings me to my next point. If we are not spouting platitudes at people in these situations, we are commandeering the conversation. It is terrifying to admit to someone that you are considering suicide. It is even more so when you're admitting it to a mental health care provider or in this case, an officer of the law because there is the added pressure of a power imbalance, of the societal history that we know people have with, pe with mental health care providers and police officers, and there's the ever-present threat of an involuntary commitment. Now, when you're talking to someone in crisis, it's not the time to start talking about your own struggles or your own anecdotal stories. It is time for active listening. One of the DBT courses, the many, many DBT courses I have taken over my life, offered some really wise advice on how to listen. First, we're often told to parrot back what we hear, right, as, as a way to show understanding. But I think we can all see the hazard in doing that of sounding exactly like a condescending parrot. Someone says, you know, I'm really struggling. Oh, you're really struggling. You know, I'm considering suicide. Oh, I hear you're considering suicide. Maybe not the most effective. So what's a better way to show understanding? Validate a synopsis of it? or ask clarifying questions on their feelings. So a statement like, I feel so worthless, no one loves me, my life will never get better, can be responded to with, I hear you saying like you feel like you don't matter because you feel unlovable. What would a life worth living feel like for you? Second, don't challenge. Yes, the client you're working with may have absolutely incorrect beliefs, like that statement of them being worthless, right? But now is not the time to get into an existential debate with someone about the worthwhileness of human existence. New research um, on interacting with people with dementia could actually, I think, be applied really usefully here. And it's the idea of agreeing and redirecting, which is somewhere in my notes. I swear they were organized when I got here this morning. There we go. So, agree and redirect, right? If someone says, I'm worthless, that can lead to, you know, I can hear how much it hurts you to feel this way. What's something you've been doing to feel better this week? We're not disagreeing with their statement because all that does is cause someone to become defensive, to stonewall, to say, well, this is my feeling and my feeling is valid which is true, but we're affirming in the way that they feel and we're redirecting onto a slightly more positive or effective or productive topic. Finally, don't start coming up with solutions unless you're asked for them. Most of us have been in therapy 
for years. We are receiving the same two or three suggestions over and over and over. Have you tried yoga? <laughs> you know, if you ate healthy and aligned your chakras, you'd feel better. Well, I mean, can't you just think positive? At some point, solution seeking is something to be done when the crisis is over. In the moment, listen, support, and help them find a short-term solution to ensure their safety. On that bridge, we stayed in the frigid winds. At this point, it is well past the time the bridge closes at 9 o'clock at night. And we stayed there until I felt able to allow him to walk me off the bridge. And after admittedly a rather fraught few hours with the California Highway Patrol, nine officers later, I had the second chance. I got to go home. A final point on that, the patients and the clients and the peers that you interact with will only be honest if they feel safe with you. I will admit that after being honest with that bridge patrol officer, I lied through my teeth to the California Highway Patrol. I was not honest with them. I knew that they did not have the gray area in their understanding of mental health to acknowledge where I was, to keep me safe, and to actually help me find equitable treatment. And so I chose to go home. Having made it off the bridge, I felt like my suicidality was a thing of the past, right? You have that moment of clarity that really comes when you're looking 225 feet down and, and considering it. And I needed the time to process that. What I want to remind you all of is there are maybe times that you need to make a decision for someone in your care or your peer or a friend or a family member to keep them safe. And yes, it may be against their will, but I would argue the vast majority of the time, if you have proven yourself over time to be a safe space to them, you will be able to work with them to further their recovery instead, whether it's a safety contract, whether it's making sure they're with someone, whether it's discussing hospitalization together as a treatment plan, it is possible if you have proven yourself to be safe for them. When I told my therapist about the miracle I felt like I'd experienced with the Golden Gate Bridge officers and coming home and that I was wholeheartedly now embracing Kevin Hines's uh, social media hashtag, be here tomorrow. After following him on social media and meeting him in person and learning that he is actively in recovery and he still experiences almost all of the symptoms of his severe bipolar disorder every single day. I told my therapist this and I was elated. And her reaction was that if I was really committed to living, I would embrace it for more than a day at a time. When I felt like I did not want to die for the first time since middle school, the person I trusted most was telling me it wasn't good enough. And I want to use that to kind of connect with a couple stories that I want us all to think about. Now, I'm no stranger to mental health treatment, right? I've been under the care of mental health care professionals for well over a decade now. Psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, medical doctors, anything you can think of. I have you know, a psych med history of over 30 different drugs. I've had multiple 5150 stays. I've gotten to try out transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is where they apparently zap electromagnetic pulses into your prefrontal cortex, uh, and even electroconvulsive therapy. I you know, it's, it's endless. It's something that you continue doing. And part of the stigma that comes with that is partially, you know, familial and peers and societal, but part of it comes from the mental health care profession. Having borderline personality disorder and bipolar type 2 Borderline personality disorder only became an official diagnosis in the DSM-3. 
Before that, and this is where the name comes from, people with my mental illness were viewed as being on the borderline between psychotic and neurotic. And our illness's penchant for leading to breakdowns, self-injury, and suicide attempts meant that historically, up until maybe 20 years ago, most of us were consigned to live our lives in state hospitals. Even now, we make up roughly two to 5% of the general American population. We represent around 20% of inpatient hospital stays. And while interestingly enough, current research has actually shown that 80% of us will achieve at least temporary remission within a decade of diagnosis. When I was diagnosed at 18, I was told it was incurable and that it would destroy every interpersonal relationship I could have in my life until statistically, I would likely die by suicide before I turn 40. As recently as 2009, Time Magazine on their front cover described it as borderline personality the disorder that doctors fear most. A simple Google search can reveal literally uncountable mental health care professionals. Keep in mind, this is in publicly accessible forums, lamenting that we are the worst patients to treat. We are discouraging, we're incurable, we're attention seeking, we're hysterical. Knowing that this is how professionals defined me and contrasting that with the idea that I could never be recovered, had a huge contribution to my ongoing struggles with mental health. My first therapist, when I was 15, I admitted for the first time that I was considering suicide. My therapist told, me, told my mother that I was attention seeking because my baby sister had just been born. It would take another five years before I would ever admit to a person that I was considering suicide. My first hospitalization at 5150, I had a panic attack on the floor and oddly enough, I couldn't manage to stand up after it so I was considered non-compliant and chemically restrained for days. During the month that I was there, my psychiatrist told me, well, after eight years of suicidal ideation, if you were actually serious about it, you would have gone through with it by now. A year later, I had my first serious suicide attempt. That was nine years after the start of my suicidal ideation. To be blunt, it had been planned for weeks and statistically, it should have been, I don't wanna say successful, it should have worked. One of my worst memories to this day is waking up in the middle of it, realizing I didn't wanna die anymore and hoping desperately I could call someone and I couldn't remember how to work a phone. When I woke up the next morning, I told my therapist at the time what I had done. She responded, well, you must have learned your lesson. I bet you won't be doing that again, will you? What do these experiences teach us? What do we notice as a common thread between them? Not a rhetorical question. <laughs> so if we look at those three experiences that I have had out of the countless others that I could share, what are the common threads? What do we see in how people handle severe mental illnesses, really drastic simple symptoms and suicidal ideation? What do we see there? Even that even healthcare professionals can't help, a lack of compassion, judgment. judgment, a lack of training on how to deal with, lack of training on how to deal with this. Right, it, 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 that exactly sums it up. It shows us that the people that we are trusting most are undereducated and under-equipped to be able to provide equitable care for us and that they can make this a lot worse. Which brings me to a final point before I continue my story. 
This ties into the idea that as service care providers, as mental health advocates, as peers, as friends, as humans, like Linda said earlier, we need to focus on becoming a safe space for the people around us. My therapist who said I wasn't committed enough to deciding to not die had been my therapist for years. We belonged to the same church and of anyone who I would have expected to know me well enough to believe my change of heart, it would have been her. If someone comes to you with that rapid paradigm shift, the rapid change of heart, really, yes, there's probably room for reasonable doubt there. But there are ways to address that without destroying someone's fragile hope. So why not try something like, wow, it sounds like you have really changed your outlook on this in such a healthy way, and I am so thrilled to hear that. Now, what can we do together? How can I support you in making sure that this paradigm change is sustainable and permanent for you? This is where I wish my story ended. I gave a previous iteration of this talk at the, Californ uh, at the Patton State Hospital through the California Memorial Project's Remembrance Day, which is an annual event that is hosted to remember the 45,000 Californians who died at state hospitals and were buried predominantly in unmarked graves. And at that, in that speech last summer, that's exactly where my talk ended. It wraps up nicely. It has a happy ending. It's hopeful. It segues really well into our coming points. And it would be dishonest. Because that relief of survival, that giddy optimism that somehow your brain has changed, right? Isn't infinite. For those of us who struggle with various mental health conditions, for many of the people you will work with or encounter or support in the future, sooner or later, that grind, that daily grind of dealing with your symptoms and your brain pain outweighs the moments of blessed clarity and hope. A few days before Christmas, this past year, I once again found myself in Northern California, about an hour from the bridge, and I had promised myself, and I'd promised everyone around me, that I wouldn't go to the bridge. And that resolve lasted about two days until I sat there and I found this really valid reason. I had to go down into San Francisco and there is only one way when you are north to easily get into the main part of the city and that is the bridge. And I went to San Francisco, I took care of what I needed to take care of and I thought, you know what? I can't do this. The draw of the bridge, the siren song of the bridge was too much. And so I timed my arrival to the bridge just perfectly that the San Francisco fog would have worn off so I could see the city and the bay one last time. I was no longer seeing my therapist, right? My trust had been broken by the weekly insistence that I didn't really not want to die. And between that and being wrapped up in the hectic day-to-day -day of a new position at work, leaving the church I had been part of for years, and understanding really for the first time the gravity of the impact that my mental health had on my romantic relationships, that self-care had fallen by the wayside. So I became complacent and thought that through sheer force of will, I could just keep myself going. Remember my suggestion earlier about helping the people that you interact with to make those self-care and paradigm shifts a permanent part of their reality? Yeah, that, that would be my 2020 hindsight of where I had absolutely neglected to do so. So I sat on the bridge at what I've come to think of as my light pole 101, the same little out jut as last time. And I brought a journal with me because in the moment, I thought that that would be an adequate substitute for my presence, thoughtful notes to my loved ones. 
The darkest parts of my brain were convinced that my most recent failure at recovery meant that I was more of a burden for them than ever. Here I was talking to people about suicide prevention and being here tomorrow and surviving and I couldn't even stay committed to it. So it'd be a note for my baby sister. Now a vivacious 10-year-old who brings me home the candy she gets at school, but only after checking it doesn't have any of my allergens. For my parents, who visited me every day, every time I've been an inpatient and cried, but still brought me frappuccinos and cigarettes so they would stave off the caffeine and nicotine withdrawals. To my partner, the most resilient person I know who I was unintentionally crushing beneath my misery because I couldn't figure out how to get better or let him go. And I sat on the bridge staring at the water and writing to them, apologizing to them. I had finished the letter to my partner and I was starting on a letter to my sister. How do you come up with the words that will speak to the 10-year-old she is now and the woman that I would not see her grow into? All I knew is if I could get the words right, they would make up for me not being present in her life, because she could know how much I love her without having to deal with the reality of me every day. My brain believed that 100%. But as I was writing, once again, the extensive training that the officers at the Golden Gate Bridge have received interfered with my plans. A sergeant who I later found out wasn't supposed to be walking the beat that day came up to me. He just wanted to get out and stretch his legs. In continuing parts of my story, I wish I didn't have to tell you. The sickest and darkest parts of my brain had realized that honesty would get me removed from the bridge. So I lied again. No, I'm not suicidal. I mean, sure, I've experienced depression, but hasn't everyone? Oh, no, I'm, I'm just journaling. The bridge is a relaxing place to sit. For the record, it's 60 degrees and windy. It is not a relaxing place to sit. What I didn't know, as we chatted more and he got my name, we had things in common, though we're fairly dissimilar, and I found out that when you are walked off the bridge by a Golden Gate Bridge patrol officer, you are not just one of the feel-good statistics the San Francisco Chronicle publishes every year about the lives saved. They write a full report, and it's in the system. And that report outed me as having come to the bridge the previous summer with one very specific intention. So I'd been chatting with my sergeant, and he got the report back from the office and he looked at me, and he was, a bl he was blunt in a way that even I did not expect. Mary, come on now. We're chatting. We're talking. We're, we've got a good relationship going, and now you're lying to me. We don't need that. Insert expletive here. Tell me, why are you here? It was two days before Christmas. Four days before my partner's birthday. My brain said we couldn't risk a 72-hour hold, and now take a moment and think about that, the depths at which a sick brain can lie. I could not risk getting help to get better because it would impact plans that I wasn't going to be alive to see. It doesn't make sense, but in that moment, the decision was clear as day. The sergeant, whose name that I am very purposely omitting for reasons, very lovely reasons that you'll see in a moment, walked me off the bridge to the CHP, only four officers this time, where once again, I lied. I stuck to the story that I was not suicidal the entire day. Thank goodness I am not Pinocchio, because at this point my nose would have been about as long as the bridge. I lied so well that the CHP officer, bless him, gave me permission to go back on the bridge. It is a public space. They, I'm sorry, they're hassling you. They cannot actually prevent you from the bridge, which, for the record, untrue. They can very much 
block access to the bridge. Luckily, my Golden Gate Bridge Patrol sergeant was not a foolish man. He did not allow me back on his bridge, and he walked me to my car. And again, that bluntness appeared. I knew they wouldn't hold you. You're too smart. Getting locked up in a place like that isn't going to help you anyway. Now tell me why you are so angry. I'm not going to let you back on my bridge. In that moment, this man in a uniform, who by his own admission has never substantively struggled with his own mental health a day in his life, became my safe space. I broke down. I told him of my recent breakup with my partner and how it was my fault because I couldn't keep my brain from hurting the man that I loved, how I had committed apostasy and was inevitably going to hell because I'd left the church where they called me an abomination and did three we thrice weekly exorcisms to cure me of my sexuality and my mental illness. How I had spent the past several years fantasizing about the bridge, how I felt like it was that my time was winding down because that suicide prevention barrier is going up. And I rattled off every statistic I knew about dying there. And let me tell you, I know them all. He looked me in the eyes and said, do you want to know, Mary, what really happens? You will jump and people will scream. It will seem like it is over because four seconds has never felt so long until we hear the boom of your body hitting the bay. You will be picked up by kids in the Coast Guard who joined to protect their country, just like that kid from the Coast Guard we picked up a couple of weeks ago who had jumped and left a note saying he couldn't face another day of picking up bodies. I broke down sobbing. It was the one thing I didn't know about jumping from the bridge. I asked him, you can hear it from the bridge? Mary, let me tell you, you can hear it from the beaches. You will ruin families' beach days forever. Now, do you have a lighter? Your partner's never reading that suicide note. And right there, in the middle of some state-owned parking lot in the dark, he burned my suicide note to ashes, which, for the record, is why you do not get to know his name, because in that moment, for him, my wellness and my survival mattered more than protocol. We talked a couple hours longer over a probably forbidden cigarette break. And he told me that I was going to go home. I was going to leave the church that told me my God didn't love me. And I was going to call him back someday. I was going to tell him that I'd found a church that tells me I am as worthy as I am because I was clearly sent as an angel to my sergeant and that he couldn't wait to hear about the difference that I would be making in, in the world because with my life story, he said there is no way that I had been given this life to not share it with others. All of that story, I suppose, is to remind you of two things. One, recovery is not a straight path. You will relapse. Your clients, your friends, your peers, they will relapse, they will fall, and they will have to get back up. And there is no shame in this. Two, that there is no one way to help people. I am fairly sure that no therapist has ever been told to make their patients cry with graphic dis descriptions of their suicide plan, or to burn suicide notes in a parking lot, or to smoke cigarettes with them, probably, admittedly, for very good reason. That is not the most ethical of approaches in therapy. But my point is that you need to follow your gut. All of the therapy and training and schooling in the world cannot replace your instincts, your empathy, that drive that motivated you to enter this profession or this community in the first place. And I hope it is a reminder as we move on to talk about intersectionality and equitable access to mental health care that exactly what you, as you are, bring to the table, to your work, to your community, is enough. Your work now and in the future will save lives. I want to talk about intersectionality 
and equitable health care access. Eventually. So I think we all know that mental health care is historically founded on Western individualistic norms, right? It approaches communication from a neurotypical, hearing, English-speaking perspective. And historically, it's really not made a whole lot of space in its training and educational approaches for people from racial, ethnic, or gender minorities. Finding a mental health care provider who specializes in these minority populations can be a challenge, even before accounting for the additional difficulties faced by people who are experiencing homelessness or poverty, are not native English speakers, or have had historically tenuous relations with medical providers, like many people of color have. As an example, within my insurance, which is a primary, uh, one of the primary companies here in California, within 50 miles of this conference, there are almost 2,000 mental health care providers with various litanies of alphabet soup letters after their name. Fewer than 500 of them say they specialize in queer and transgender patients. 400 say that they are qualified to help with cultural or ethnic issues. Four are able to work with deaf and hard of hearing clients. Not a single one lists themselves as competent in working with blind or low vision consumers or people experiencing homelessness. 24 of these providers self-identify as black, 60 as Asian or Indian, 93 as Hispanic, and one as Native. The remaining identify as white. Interestingly, despite being insured by a major provider, I cannot filter the results by the language the provider speaks. For those of us with intersectional identities who have the privilege of obtaining mental health care, because we need to recognize that is absolutely a privilege, we are still forced to prioritize parts of our experience in finding a provider. We find ourselves weighing pros and cons. Do I prefer the therapist who says I'm going to hell for being gay but understands my Asperger's, or should I go with the one who's also queer but firmly believes I'd be happy if I could walk more? Or what about maybe that third one who's really skilled at DBT but said that reverse racism is a bigger problem than police violence against people of color. Take your pick. All of them are, are therapists that I have dealt with. To be clear, as people seeking treatment, we don't expect to find a therapist who checks every intersectional box in our arsenal. Instead, my point to you is that cultural competency and a willingness to listen and learn outside of your one hour a week with a specific client is the game changer. In, in the book called Building Bridges, Tools for Developing an Organization's Cultural Competence, the authors put forth six stages of cultural competency. The first is seeing other cultures as inferior. Second is adopting sometimes unintentional paternalism towards, other, towards minority cultures. Third is seeking to assimilate the minority culture into the majority culture because the majority culture is still viewed as better. Fourth is beginning to realize one's own oppressive views and committing to improving them. Fifth is respecting other cultures and self-monitoring for oppressive views. And six, the final quote unquote final stage is advocating and educating on behalf of oppressed groups. I urge you to honestly consider where you are along those six. Remembering that it is very possibly different when you're considering different marginalized groups. You may be very aware of racial issues and very undereducated on issues facing queer people. You may know a lot about disability rights and you may know next to nothing about the, the realities of someone who's a refugee or an undocumented immigrant. There is no shame in discovering your own lack of awareness or education because that is the only way that you can commit to doing better in the future.
So Kimber, well, black civil rights advocate and Columbia law professor Kimberly W. Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality in 1989. Her first use of the term was in a paper discussing why white feminism was not adequate for black women. It has since gone on to describe, with her consent for the record, it has since gone on to encapsulate exactly what we're going to be discussing towards the end of this talk. The idea, one, that systems of power marginalize and oppress people. Two, that individuals can be impacted by two or more of these systems of oppression simultaneously. And three, the interplay between those various marginalizations that they are experiencing create unique embodied experiences that can differ from those experienced by someone belonging to a single minority group. I want you all to take a moment to consider the identities of people in your lives, or of you yourself even, that span more than a couple of minority communities. Because so often, what we see is that in the rare situation that we actually discuss intersectionality, we limit people to two, maybe at most three identities that we allow them to experience. So maybe a black deaf woman, a gay immigrant. That's all, right? Because the idea that you might belong to a wide host of communities that are traditionally within Western cultures marginalized and oppressed is the quickest way to get a scad of angry Facebook commenters calling you a special snowflake. Which, as a tangent that I think might be my favorite part of this entire talk, the term snowflake was first used in Fight Club, right? It is a movie written by a gay man as a satirical criticism of heteronormative male fragility and an exploration of the way that those groups of, of people who feel disempowered or weak can use dehumanizing language to create a false sense of loyalty within themselves. So just a thought next time we see the prevalence of snowflake as an insult on Facebook. We limit people to these boxes, right? You get two or maybe three identities. But by doing that, we are not only refusing to hear their lived experience, we're not only limiting our own potential for understanding the world, but for those of us who will go on to work in mental health care professions, we are significantly negatively impacting our ability to provide or receive equitable and intersectional mental health care. So now think of those people in your life whose identities do span more than two or three marginalized groups. Consider what that means for them and what that means for their daily lived experience. Or, if you can't think of people like that in your life, think of why that is. Do people not trust you enough to share with you? Do the circles you run in limit you from meeting people outside of your own social strata? And what does that mean for your ability in the future to provide care or support that is equitable and educated, that does not rely on already oppressed people educating you in the moment? There is absolutely a tendency for those of us, even who are active in oppression studies or are members of oppressed minority groups ourselves, to look at others and to have that tiniest corner of our minds doubt their lived experiences. And I want to validate that because I think a lot of us experience it, right? We don't intend to. We want to believe them. But there's just that little inner voice that says, well, you know, is it really that bad? Are they making it up? Are they attention seeking? Maybe they're a snowflake. And I think that something worth noting on that is that I read a post once, and I'm outing myself as a millennial, right? It was a Tumblr post. 
But it stuck with me. I read it years ago and I can still, still think of it. That the first reaction you have is what you were encultured to believe. And if we look at the society that for those of us born in Western cultures, we're born into, those thoughts aren't great. Maybe it's you walk past a black man and you, and you clutch your purse a little bit tighter because your gut reaction goes, ooh, something could happen. Maybe you walk past two lesbians on the street who are holding hands and your gut reaction is, ooh, do they really have to do that in public? Or maybe your gut reaction is you look at a person with a disability and go, oh my God, that's so sad, I couldn't live like that. Those oftentimes are the reactions that we are absolutely groomed to have first. But what this post said that has stuck with me is that's just what has been cultivated as normative for us. The second reaction is who you are. So if your follow-up reaction to seeing a woman in an outfit that you don't think is flattering is, no, you know what, good for her wearing what she wants to wear because she is killing it. That is indicative of who you are and who you're going to be. And that is what matters. And that is something to think about when we discuss intersectionality, equitable care, access, all of these things. Because your gut reaction or your historical isms, right, the things that you grew up believing that oppress and marginalize other groups matter less than your belief and your potential for growing past them. I'm going to rattle off some statistics for you when it comes to oppressed and marginalized groups and mental health care. African Americans are 20% more likely to experience mental health disabilities than white Americans. Only 5% of Hispanic people in America with mental health disabilities will seek mental health care services. A 1994 study, while admittedly slightly outdated now, found that while African Americans, Native Americans, Alaskan Natives, and Latinx and Hispanic populations are statistically underrepresented in accessing outpatient mental health care, they are dramatically overrepresented in state hospitals and institutions. LGBTQIA people are three times more likely to experience a serious mental health disorder than their straight and cisgender peers. With LGBTQ youth, more than four times more likely to attempt suicide. If we look at the transgender community, a staggering 20% of our transgender youth have attempted suicide. 41% of transgender adults have attempted suicide at least once in their life. Compare that to cisgender youth, which has a percentage of 0.007% of them having attempted suicide by 18. 0.6% of cisgender adults have attempted suicide at least once. A study from England has showed that people with some sort of physical disability are four times more likely to attempt suicide. So what, what does this mean, right? If we look at the fact that mental health care is traditionally from a very, very narrow perspective, we look at the number of marginalized and oppressed people who statistically need services, need support, but don't have an infrastructure to receive them. And we look at ourselves, right? What do I have to offer? What can I provide? What difference can I make? I would offer four suggestions. Firstly, start off with self-reflection. Look at your own identities. Consider the impact they have on your life. Of course, consider the big things, right? Your race, your religion, your socioeconomic class, 
your gender or your sexuality, but also start to consider the less commonly considered parts of your life. Are you married or single? How does that impact it? Do you have children? Have you ever experienced a miscarriage or infertility? Are you and your family food secure? Or are you constantly wondering where your next meal is going to come from and how you're going to make rent? All of those things have a huge impact on the way that you relate to others and the care and support that you can provide. During that self-reflection, also take the time to look at the parts of you that make you uncomfortable. It goes back to that, that gut reaction, right? Take a moment and actually unpack those. Remember that you don't have to be shamed by them. There is nothing wrong with admitting that you have been raised into a culture that you don't want to perpetuate. The only, the only way to address that is to acknowledge that they exist for you. And it gives you that opportunity to critically unpack your own worldviews. And rather than maintaining that internalized oppression, have the ability to work to ally yourself to marginalized communities instead. Secondly, make room for the voices of those who are most directly impacted. These typically are not the speakers and authors and presenters you're going to see in your textbooks or at your college campus. Instead, make a point to read books and listen to podcasts and watch TED Talks by the people that academia and you know, essentially the white Western medical world has not made room for. By learning to accept and listen to their truth without trying to filter it through your own lens, you can grow into a safe person for people to come to and be open with and receive support from. Third, focus on inclusivity. One voice, no matter how popular or how loud, does not represent an entire group. You know, I, I think of, of how often minority cultures get one or two spokespeople that become popular, right? I mean, within my own community, I look, to be frank, at people like Temple Grandin. They are not representative of many of those of us who are on the spectrum, but they are what people want to listen to or you see it specifically within communities of color. You find the one or two people who are light-skinned enough and whitewashed enough and into respectability politics enough that they don't alarm the powers that be. And so they get idolized. They get put on a pedestal. What we need to do is expand those resources we just talked about, right? Like the TED Talks and the books and the podcasts from people who aren't heard, we need to expand those even more into the small voices, the quiet voices, the outliers, the ones who aren't given a platform. When you're with your coworkers, for example, who might have different identities than you, or with your peers or your friends who try to speak up and get silenced down because they're not quite loud enough yet, make sure that they have a space at the table and make sure that they're thoughts are heard. Finally, focus on community. Especially in this current political climate, we are incredibly divided from our neighbors. To quote the slightly problematic but still favorite Dumbledore, we are only as strong as we are united, as weak as we are divided. Foster relationships both personal and professional, with minority communities you're not familiar with. Hold space for others who experience different oppressions than you do, because it is the only equitable and inclusive and intersectional way for social justice to move forward. Mental health care, like all embodied and holistic fields, is simply a microcosm of the climate that we are fostering around us. 
the care and services and support that you can provide will always reflect your commitment to equity and inclusion. I'd like to conclude with a quote a friend of mine recently posted, which I think summarizes what we've discussed today quite well. Equ equality is that everyone is invited to the party. Equity is that everyone gets to dance. But inclusion is when everyone can add to the playlist. So I leave you with this, a question to keep in the back of your mind. In my interactions with others, especially those who are from different communities than I am, am I allowing everyone to add to the playlist? Thank you.